As we are settling in, a couple of announcements I'd like to make. One is to remind folks about the Christmas Eve service. We are still moving forward on that. So uh, Christmas Eve, 8 o'clock uh, here at the church, our candlelight service. We usually do two. We're just going to do the one service this, uh, this year. So you are invited to that. We'd uh, love to have you come out and uh, celebrate that. But uh, we also know it's, uh, you may be somewhere else. So, uh, but do want to extend that invitation to uh, our Christmas Eve service. Um, also, uh, we are doing something a little off the cuff today with our, with our kids uh, because uh, the junior youth are having a little Christmas get-together and I asked Carrie if she would be willing to help out a little bit and have the younger kids join in that. Not right away, I got that look. <laughs> So if the younger kids could hang out in the service for a little while, and then we'll, really, we'll, we'll send you down early enough so you can have a little treat as well. Um, so that uh, we're going to do some, just pay attention, and we'll tell you what's going to happen on that, okay? Um, so we want to uh, uh, kind of celebrate that a little bit today. And we had a, a few younger kids coming in there. So we have uh, two large tubs of uh, cheese balls. So if that's Christmas food, yeah, you're excited about that, aren't you? <laughs> You're maybe not so much excited about the cheese balls. So, uh, uh, yeah, hang, hang out, and we'll, we'll try to direct you as we go. This is kind of a special day. Uh, it's the uh, last Sunday of Advent, uh, and Christmas is coming up this week, so we want to enjoy that time together here. Um, that's it. No, oh my goodness. The very important thing is that Carrie needs a couple people to help her out down there. So we got one volunteer. Would somebody else be interested in helping Carrie with the young people? Serious? Okay. Carrie, uh, Tasha will be down there too. So a lot of people raise their hands. So um, there, I almost forgot to do that. That would have been terrible. Here's all these kids, Carrie, all by yourself. So, <laughs> so good. All right. So did you have something? All right. I'm getting out of the way. We're still doing some announcements. I have to stay put. Thank you. Good morning. So, uh, I gotta get things open here and move the mic around. So I gotta yell at myself since I'm the sound guy that always yells at when you play with the mic. <laughs> so um, today I'm gonna start out reading Psalms 47. Clap your hands to all you people. Shout to the God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, for the Lord, the Most High is awesome, a great King over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord and the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, 
sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises for God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a song. God is king over all nations. He sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. And just my old Bible here, well, it's not that old. That's one that uh, one year mom and dad got all of us kids, there's four of us, Bibles for Christmas with the cover and everything. And uh, bad, dad being dad, well, he could get a discount when he got five, so he got one for himself as well. <laughs> so anyway, um, and I'm going to go ahead and go into the scripture reading which is Isaiah 40, uh, 1 through 5. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all the people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And if you would, uh, join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to come together and, and give praise to you and listen to your word and hear the stories and celebrate the coming of your son. May we listen to the word and understand it as you open our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now I got an Advent reading that I was told to read in some really big print because John knows I'm blind. Oh, well, at reading, real. Close. You know, my arms are not quite long enough anymore. The Spirit of God welcomes you to worship today. On this, the fourth Sunday of Advent, while we are often resistant to the prophet's call to repentance, we also see that John's word was one of preparation. John knew this truth, that Jesus was coming. We gather together to make a straight road in our hearts, ready to receive the redeeming love of our God.
changing the numbers of songs and things. Matt's laughing back there. I'd like to invite the kids to come forward. You are the first one here. Good morning, good morning, good morning. So, you all know kind of what we're working on here, right? We're talking about the Advent candles and all the different things that the Advent candles remind us of, very important things, right? So who, can rem who remembers what the first one was that we did? Peace. Hope. hope. Hope, right. Good morning. And we, did, we talked about hope because back in the Old Testament, before Jesus came, all the prophets, the people that, that heard what God was saying, said that, that the Messiah was going to come. You guys know about the Messiah, Jesus. And that was going to happen. And so it gave people hope. So who has not lit a candle yet? You have not lit one? Okay, so you get to light the hope candle, all right? That's the first one right in front by the dove. So it's important to have hope. Oh, I mean, you might need to, yeah, pull that one down and click the trigger. <laughs> there you go. And you got, that's kind of a, oh my, hang on a second. Good job. All right, so hope. The second one, do you remember what the second one was? Oh, it's peace. That's right. Peace because what Jesus brings is peace. When we don't really get along sometimes, Jesus can help us to uh, see each other and love each other and help each other get along. And most importantly, Jesus makes peace between God and us, which is really important. So peace is the second candle. Who hasn't lit a candle yet? You it? Okay. Would you like to light the candle? I can help her. Okay, so we got to light this one up here. It's kind of a ways up there. Can I pick you up? Would that be all right? <laughs> ah, okay. All right, and we're going to hold this button down. Click. There we go. Peace. All right, now. What's the third candle? Do you guys remember that one? Joy. joy. Yes, we got to joy. Joy is a special one. We use a pink candle for joy. And joy means that when Jesus comes, we can be excited and celebrate. Right? J-O-Y. So who hasn't lit? G-O-Y? J-O-Y. Who hasn't lit a candle yet? You don't want to? Yeah, okay. That's fine. Hudson, would you like to light it? Okay, Hudson. Come on. Can I pick you up? Because it's clear up at the very top on this one. Around. Okay. Got a clicky, clicky. Okay. Oh, we're not there yet. Good job. Don't know yet. We haven't got that far. I don't know what I'm doing this afternoon. So, all right. So we have one more candle to light before the Christ candle, which is the white one in the middle. Who can guess what this one is? Good guess. Love. Exactly. Now, today we're going to talk about John the Baptist. Nope. No, grace. Okay, that's another one. <laughs> we'll talk about grace some other time. For Advent, we have, we have hope and peace and joy and love. Okay? And love, basically, God loves us so much that he sends his son. And today we're going to talk about John the Baptist who got us ready for Jesus to come. Okay? So, who, has everybody lit one? You don't, you, you'll do it. <laughs> and Grace, would you like to light one? I know you guys. All right. All right, come around back over here. That's probably the best place. All right, can you get it? All right, so let's go through these again so that we know what God brings to us in, during the Advent season and all year long. The first one is? Hope. hope. The second one is? Peace. peace. The third joy. one is joy. joy. Are you jumping the gun there? <laughs> and the last one is? Love. Love. And all of these things help us get ready for the final one, which we're going to light on Christmas Eve, which is the candle that helps us remember that Christ came. That's the one. Exactly. Jesus Christ. 
All right, let's pray together, okay? Dear Lord, we thank you for all these reminders. And we don't really need candles or anything special, or even the season to remind us because all of these things are with us all the time. You bring us hope and peace and joy and love every day, all the time. And so we thank you for this gift that goes beyond just this season and it stays with us all the year long. We thank you for these young people who are learning about you. We ask that you would open their hearts and help them to receive your word and to do your will. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks guys. So if the bigger kids don't eat all the treats, then there'll be some down there. Did I say that out loud? I shouldn't have said that out loud. Blaming it on these bigger kids. We've been spending quite a bit of time in Luke's first chapter. We're going to stay there for our message today. I want to invite you to turn to that first chapter of Luke for our scripture reading this morning. It's a passage that we referenced last week. This is the text that we drew from Luke chapter 1, beginning in the 39th verse. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who believes that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. There's an interesting Jewish folk tale, a, a legend of sorts that uh, offers an explanation for this little dimple right here beneath your nose and, and on top of your lips. Maybe some of you have heard this, this story. According to the, the folk tale, when a child is conceived, an angel keeps them company in the womb and it teaches them all the wisdom of the Torah, all these wonderful truths, even the secrets of the universe, the story goes. And then at the moment of birth, when the child enters the light, the angel bends down and touches their lips as if to shush them so they don't share all the secrets and all the wisdom of the universe. And all of that gets buried in the silence and forgotten in the moment. The angel's touch leaves that little divot there beneath our nose, uh, above our lips. And we spend a lifetime after that trying to recover this stuff that we once understood in the womb. It's a nice story. The, the philosopher Plato uh, played around with this idea that knowledge isn't so much learned as it is remembered. Um, and the modern psychologist Carl Jung talked about the concept of a collective unconscious, this idea that there are things in our mind that are just there, inherently known. We don't have to learn them. Maybe there's something to this Jewish tale. Uh, maybe we know a lot more than we think we know. Maybe learning is more remembering, reacquiring, than it is getting a hold of something new and novel. I think about this folk tale when I think about Luke's account of John the Baptist. When Mary comes up to the house where Elizabeth and, and Zechariah live and she calls out to Elizabeth, and the child in Elizabeth's womb leaps. And I, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth understands that this is a leap of joy, that she is overwhelmed, that the child is excited about this encounter. This unborn child knows something that the rest of the world doesn't. The unborn child, John, knows that there's something special going on, something special happening, something unprecedented, something glorious. Now, the precise chronology, it's a little hidden to us, but it may be that Mary was already carrying the child, Jesus, when she visits Elizabeth. Elizabeth seems to be using the present tense when she talks about the fruit of Mary's womb and, and Mary being the mother of her Lord. It's possible 
that Mary's desire, that everything would work out according to God's perfect will, had already happened. And that this, this, this interaction was the first interaction between Jesus and John. And so there are these two children in that picture, as yet unborn, interacting with each other in some special and inspirational way. The unborn John knows something, something wonderful. John's an important person uh, in each of the gospel accounts. Each of the four gospels has quite a bit about him. There's this sense that he's a a prominent figure, uh, even to the degree that we might lose sight of what role it is that he actually plays in this redemptive plan that God brings about through Jesus. What do we think about when we think about John? What are the things that we've read and that uh, that draw our attention? That camel hair tunic that he wears? I don't know, that's kind of different, isn't it? That draws our, our, the leather belt that he has on. Is it the locusts and the wild honey that he eats? Oh, that's kind of interesting stuff. It, 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 it draws our attention, probably like it did for the folks back in his day. What about what he did? I mean, it's, it's right there in his title, John the Baptist. We know that's part of what he's doing. There's whole reams, mountains of papers and books and things that have been written on what John's baptism was all about and what it represented and where it came from and how it was connected to all the other rituals of the day. We even dwell on his message, the things that he said, at least certain parts of it. When that voice cries out in the wilderness, we hear that prophetic call to repent, repent. And we start looking around for applications of it even today, here and now. Now, all of this stuff is in the Bible. It's all part of John's story. It's part of Jesus' story. And so it's not insignificant. These are important points. But I suspect that all of these elements, as important as they may be, they're supplemental to John's primary purpose. Luke has a particular idea, a particular concept of what John's purpose is. It's woven into the whole narrative of the first couple chapters of this gospel if you notice there's a lot of things that are in parallel here that are that reflect each other when it comes to the way that the birth of Jesus is announced and and the way that John's birth is announced you notice that in the story it's the same angel the same angel Gabriel who comes to both Zachariah and to Mary to let them know what's going on in words that are so similar and so familiar that it's almost like Gabriel's reading off the same note cards when he comes to both of them Both Mary and Zechariah, they break out into song, songs of glory when what's happening is revealed and it overcomes them. But there's some differences in the story too. Mary, we talked about this last week, she's kind of a weak, marginalized figure. She she doesn't represent a whole lot of prestige or power in her her community. Now, Zechariah and Elizabeth, they're a little bit different. They're a little more socially secure there. They come from a respectable family of priests. Now, Zechariah and Elizabeth's child, it's, it's miraculous in the way all children are miraculous, and even more than that, born in their old age. But it's not outside of the realm of human experience. That kind of thing does happen on occasion. But Mary's situation, that's without precedent. Nothing like that has ever happened or ever will again. And Luke is masterful in the way that he weaves these similarities and these differences together, letting us know in no uncertain terms that John and Jesus are connected, but not the same. Each one of them has a role to play, and those roles are not the same. They don't overlap. Last week, we took a look at Mary's song from the first chapter of Luke, known as the Magnificat. And and this week we're going to look for a moment at Zachariah's song. That's called the Benedictus. Again, from that Latin first word of the song, meaning blessed. You remember the story again. You've probably heard it multiple times. Uh, Zachariah, he's serving in the temple. He gets called up to do his two weeks, one of his two weeks services. And, and he's there burning incense at the altar of incense. And who shows up? The angel Gabriel shows up, totally unexpected and, and unlooked for. And, and he comes to him and he says, you and Elizabeth are going to have a kid, and, which is Zachariah is understandably unsettled by this. He asks for proof about it. To, you know, how will I know this is so? Verse 18 there, if you want to look at it. 
That seems like a reasonable question, doesn't it? Maybe one that we might ask. Uh, But I think that Gabriel had a better idea of the depth of Zechariah's doubt here. Whatever the reason is, Zechariah is struck mute. He can't speak because of this question he asks. And he, he stays that way all through Elizabeth's pregnancy. And then finally when the child comes, and they're going to have him circumcised on the eighth day as is appropriate, and they're going to name, all the people around are going to name him Zachariah because that's you know, going to name him after dad. And, and Elizabeth says, nope, his name will be John. And they're like, ah, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Let's get Zachariah in here and see what he thinks about this. And he motions for a pad of something to write on, and he, he writes down, his name is John. And finally, finally, as he follows through in obedience, he finally catches up, Zechariah can speak. After nine months of being mute, I don't know, Elizabeth might have liked that, I don't know. But after nine months, this is what comes out, this song, the Benedictus. According to Luke 1, 67, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. And again, finally, he catches up with the rest of the family. They've already had this spirit visit them. Here we are, Zacharias sings out, Blessed, blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. So I don't want you to miss this. I hope you, again, have your Bibles open there to the first chapter and you're looking at that song that Zacharias sings. Don't miss the fact that the bulk of of the first part of this song, most of this song, and this is in the light of of the miraculous birth of his own son. It's at his circumcision that he's singing this. Most of the song is not about John. Most of this song is about Jesus. This is a song about Jesus. Zacharias sings first about the mighty Savior from the house of David. First, about the one spoken of by the prophets, about the one that would save them from their enemies, the one that would allow them to finally serve God without fear. Jesus comes first, even in Zechariah's song. And it's not until the end of the song that Zechariah finally gets around to his own son and his role, beginning in verse 76. And you, child... And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. This is where we're getting at John's primary purpose. Go back to that text that Mark read from Isaiah Isaiah 40, from the beginning of our service today. Isaiah 40, the prophet speaks, speaks out of one crying out, I go forward into Luke chapter 3, and Luke quotes this passage, connecting it to John. Now, there's an interesting divergence here, if you, if you noticed it there. Isaiah's words are a little different than the way that Luke quotes them. Isaiah's words are more like this. A voice cries out, and then the voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. As if the wilderness is the place where the way will be prepared. And Luke says it a little differently. The way that Luke says it is this. It is a voice crying out in the wilderness saying, prepare a way for the Lord. As if the voice comes from the wilderness. Now this is a great way that Luke is including two ideas in one. Luke is deliberately quoting from the Greek translation here in Isaiah where the voice comes from the wilderness. And this fits John to a T. This is exactly where he is. In the wilderness, you see it at the end of this chapter, in verse 80 of this chapter, he spends his life out there preparing, getting ready himself for this work that he has to do. He is out in the wilderness crying out. But the core of John's message, it carries the meaning from Isaiah, the original meaning, the voice crying out that a way needs to be prepared in the wilderness. This is John's purpose. John's purpose is to prepare the way. Now, John's not just the Baptist, although that is what he does. John is not just a prophet, although he fills that role. John's primary job is to be the forerunner, 
the one that comes before, the one that gets things ready. Notice what Zechariah says here in his song. You will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. Notice what Luke says about John and the prophecy that he uses. John is that voice crying in the wilderness saying what? Prepare the way. Prepare the way. This is John's job. John's purpose. He's the one that comes before the Messiah, getting people ready for the coming king. And this is important stuff. The image that both Isaiah and Luke are using here is the construction of a royal road. So I want you to imagine for a moment. Imagine a city out in somewhere in Palestine or in that area. It's maybe a little deserty, a little scrubby, maybe something like the Owyhees out here. And there's a city out there, and there's little roads and things that go around the city. But the further you get out from the city, the more the roads are kind of not very good. Okay, so I want you to have that picture in your mind. What Luke and Isaiah are saying is that there is a time to construct a better road. When a significant ruler, let's say an emperor that, that, that is over a large empire, when he decides, I'm going to go visit this town out in the scrubland, out in the, out in the hill country, I'm going to go visit this town that I haven't been to before. Okay, Something has to happen for him to be accepted and welcomed into this town. There's some preliminary work that has to go down before he can visit on his royal visit. You don't want the king coming into your town using an old donkey track or a shepherd's path, okay? You need a road. You need a royal road, one that's going to accommodate all the king's entourage that comes with him. So it has to be a pretty significant road. And two, one that fits the royal personage, one that shows the amount of respect that you have for the visiting king. So if your road is crooked, if your road is dangerous, if your road is uneven, if your road is narrow and winding, that shows exactly what you think of the king. Not much. But if it's straight and it's smooth, where the low spots are filled in and the high spots are graded down, then that shows that you are ready for the king's visit. And this is what John is doing. This is what John is doing, getting the road ready. He's the advanced man. He's that engineer that goes out and drives a bunch of stakes and says, this is where the road needs to go. He lays out the track. He gets the people in the town busy, in the community busy, getting ready, making the road what it needs to be. All right? But his job is completely and totally meaningless outside of the context of the coming of the king. Why would he do it if there weren't a king coming? You don't. This is where we need to be mindful of John's real role. John was a lot of things. There was a lot of things. He stayed out of formal politics. He was out on the margins, but he was definitely a political figure in his day. He was a prophet in the Old Testament tradition. He was an innovator. He was introducing a form of baptism that broke with all the patterns of the day. He was a revivalist. He was a preacher. He was a fire and brimstone caller to repentance. He was all of these things. An outcast that attracted the attention of the most powerful. But all of this stuff, they're just parts of the greater whole. Elements that make up his primary calling to prepare the way. The hearts of the people, that's the wilderness. That's where the road needs to be made. There needs to be some preparation in that wilderness to accommodate the coming Messiah. The road needs to be graded, the low has to be lifted, the high has to be brought down. They needed to get ready. All the people needed to get ready. They needed someone to help them get ready because the time had come. Finally, the time had come. The king was on the way. The most important thing you could do is prepare. If we take a look at Luke and we take his assessment seriously and view John in the light of his status and his work as a forerunner, then everything else that John does takes on a little different flavor. John was certainly a prophet. I mean, that's, that's the truth. Zechariah's own song affirms that he is a prophet. And the prophets were well known for calling people to account. 
You need to straighten up. That's the prophet's message. You got this long tradition of the prophets coming into an established community, a place pretty well settled in their ways, people mired in a status quo that rewards oppression and greed and takes advantage of the weaker members of the community, and then preaching this message of repentance. The prophet challenged the powerful, afflicted the comfortable, usually did not make a lot of friends in that group. Not real popular among those folks. And John, John is right there with these prophets doing the same thing that they're doing. We see this later in his ministry when he says that he calls the religious leaders a brood of vipers, a nest of snakes. That's in Matthew. Luke just says the crowd when he talks about who these folks are. He warns them that the axe is at the root of the tree. It's just about to be chopped down. It's almost in the fire unless they bear good fruit. This is that fire. This is that judgment that, that John is speaking as far as the prophetic messages are concerned. But I want to encourage you, don't get too caught up in John's prophetic message here and lose sight of his role as a forerunner. Here's what I mean. John did stand in this long line of prophets who challenged the religious rituals that didn't lead to an actual transformed life. Luke 3, uh, 8 and 9, he says that they need to be fruitful, not depend on the fact that they're Abraham's children. For John, just like all the other prophets before him, repentance was the deal. Repentance was the deal. They wanted people to turn from what they were doing and the way they were going and start being obedient to God. They were insistent that the people stop play-acting at being religious and actually start doing what God wanted them to do. This is at the core of John's message of repentance. In Luke 3, when the crowd asked him, well, what does that mean? What are we supposed to do? John tells them, do these things. This is what obedience will look like. So, so far, John's prophetic message of repentance, it's in perfect alignment with all the previous prophets. It's a great message. It's one that people need to hear. But John is not just a prophet. You see, his repentance, his message of repentance, it's framed within this role of a forerunner. You see, when Isaiah says it, when Micah says it, when Ezekiel and Amos say it, when they call for repentance, this is a call to return to the heart of the law that God had revealed to them in the past. When John calls the people to repentance, it's not so much looking back. It's a call to get ready for something that's coming in the future. This is an important distinction. So much of the prophetic word leading up to this point, so much of what the prophets said over and over again had been about returning. Returning. Return to the law. Return to the Lord. Return to your first love. Here, John's not calling them to return, but to look forward. Look in anticipation. Yeah, there's a lot that's consistent here. This is truly the same message that we're talking about. God's will is consistent throughout. We're always supposed to be obedient to it. But John is unique. The first, the last, the only prophet whose message wasn't all about going back. When John preaches repentance... He's looking ahead. He's looking forward. It's in anticipation of the only one who could make our repentance worth anything. You might wonder, what's the difference? Is there really a difference? What's the difference between John and all these other prophets who preached repentance? What's the big deal about John being a forerunner? Here's, here's what I think it is. Here's why I think Luke makes such a fuss about identifying John as the one who prepares the way, not just the one that preaches repentance. You see, all of these previous prophets, as mighty men of God as they've been, all this calling of people to turn around, turn back, return, that's the meaning of the word repentance. All of them wanted the people to be obedient to God, all of them. And yet, over and over again, people failed. 
over and over again, the prophet delivered this message, the very word of God spoken to them, and over and over again, the people rejected that word and went on their own way. Yeah, there were a few glimmers. Once in a while, somebody got it right, somebody repented and, and, and walked in obedience, but nothing really stuck for very long. Inevitably, it seems, people eventually went back to their disobedient ways. It seems like this, this confrontational message and method, the prophets, it was only marginally effective. It only went so far. It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to know what you were supposed to do, to be told what you're supposed to do. It wasn't enough to just receive the word of God. That anointing only got them so far. The people needed something more. We need something more. We need divine intervention. You see, prophets can't do it on their own. Prophets cannot bring about repentance. As much as they proclaim it, as much as they call for it, as much as they preach it, prophets can't get it done. It doesn't matter how strong they are, how charismatic they are. Now, their message is true. It might be as true as all get out. But it's amazing how people can ignore the truth and walk away from the truth. And unfortunately, sometimes the more passionate the message, sometimes the more fiery the message, the more people end up resisting that message. Getting punched in the face about stuff doesn't always lead to a positive outcome. There needs to be something more, something more than just pointing out failure and the need for repentance. There has to be a way to make things right. And this is what John is doing. Getting people ready for the way to make things right. And John's clear. I got a good word, he says. This is an important thing for you to hear. But there is someone coming after me that is more powerful than I am. Someone whose sandals I'm not even worthy to untie. Someone, when I baptize with water, someone is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. There's somebody coming, so get ready. John's job, it's not just to try to get people to repent, but to get people ready for a repentance that actually means something. You see, repentance without Jesus, it don't amount to much. It's pretty meaningless. A person can be good for a while. I mean, most of us can. Well, you guys can. You can be good for a while, but if evidence of history is any indication, repentance based on human willpower only goes so far. Repentance without Jesus, that's just another one of those religious rituals that ultimately is ineffectual. To really make a change, to really become a new creature, we need Jesus. We don't need a prophet. We need Jesus. John wasn't calling people to repentance in that old way, repentance that was built on our own limited strength. John was telling people that the time was finally come to repent for good, a true transformation. It was time to welcome the king. It was time to open the gates to your city and welcome him in on that royal road and be filled with the Spirit of God, the only thing that can really make a difference in our lives and make us who we need to be. Now John's message, it sounded an awful lot like the old prophets, but it had this particular flavor that their message missed. It pointed to the only way repentance could really be realized through Jesus and promise that the Messiah was imminent. Oh, that's a rich thing to know that the king is coming down the road and is almost here. Hmm. This is a little bit of a flight of fancy, I know. But I'd like to think that the child John, as yet unborn, understood this. Understood this maybe in a way that we as, as adults don't 
understand things. Maybe John had some wisdom in the womb. Maybe it was something that was whispered to him by the angels. That Jesus, that Jesus, the one that was coming, was finally coming to make a true repentance and true salvation finally possible. Why else would he leap for joy in Elizabeth's womb? And what could be a better thing to devote his life to than to get people ready for Jesus? What could be a better thing for any of us to do? I want to invite you to take the insert that was in your bulletins for our prayer. I want you young people to share in this. That's why you're still here. And then after that, you can be dismissed and head on down there and see if there's some hot chocolate and stuff for you. Does that sound cool? You all right with that? Okay. So this is a prayer, and I invite you to join me in saying together. I'll do the leader part. We'll do the, the last part of that together. If you would, be in an attitude of prayer with me. God of faithfulness and truth, you sent your servant John the Baptist to preach in the desert and summon people to repentance. Make us and all things new that in the wilderness of our hearts we too may prepare a way over which your son may walk. Amen. Young people are dismissed. Dave, let's sing that song. Let's sing it a couple times. We'll sing it a couple of times. Go to the mountain, and we burn the hills and bear. Are you ready to tell it on the mountain? Are you going to go proclaim that Christ is born? Come on. Amen. Amen. I hope so. If you'd bow with me. Lord, we ask your blessing on these, your people. They are your children, and they are precious to you. We ask that you would keep them safe in what they do, uh, guide them and direct them, give them opportunities to proclaim on the mountainsides and in the valleys and every nook and cranny that Jesus has come. That we have a chance at salvation through his precious blood. We are overwhelmed by the love that you give to us. We ask that you would give them opportunities to share this message. Keep them safe until we can meet again. We pray for those that cannot be with us, that are worshiping in their homes. And we ask that you would be present to them as well. And bind us in spirit when we cannot be bound in person. We thank you for the way that you are with us. And we pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. You may go in peace.